Okay, shall we start? Yeah. <coughs> okay, well, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Welcome to this webinar, which has been organized by COST, uh, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative, and it will share insights from implementing the Infrastructure Transparency Index, or ITI, the acronym that we use. My name is Peter Matthews. I'm the Executive Director of the COST International Secretariat, and I'll be moderating the session today. We have recently concluded process of piloting the ITI in Costa Rica, Honduras, Uganda, Ukraine, and Sekondi Takaradi in Ghana. Now, this event is an opportunity for us to share the results from that testing, uh, to hear your questions and comments, and discuss together how the ITI might be used in the future. In a moment, I'm going to explain how we will structure uh, the webinar. But before doing that, just a couple of uh, practicalities. I would like to encourage all participants as you're listening, if you have comments or questions, to insert them in the chat. There will be an opportunity, there's some time specifically dedicated to Q&A. But if you put them in the chat, I'll keep an eye on them. And if there's a question that's particularly pertinent as someone is speaking, then I will uh, attempt to bring it in at the right moment. Um, I may also, when we come to the Q&A session, ask you to, to, to speak directly, but it will be very helpful if you could put your questions and comments uh, in the chat, please. Uh, I would also encourage, we have a number of participants. Um, I also want you to be very active. So please do, don't feel like your role is simply answering questions and responding to what our, uh, to other participants say. I would like you to be active and do feel free to ask your own questions of your, your co-panelists. Uh, secondly, in practical terms, just to point out that we do have simultaneous English and Spanish translation. And if you want to select either of those options, just go to the toolbar that's immediately uh, below the video screen uh, that you can see. Okay, so over the course of the next uh, 90 minutes, we've got a, a great program and some really fantastic speakers lined up uh, for this event. The first contributor is going to be my colleague, uh, Evelyn Hernandez. Could I ask anyone, uh, could you uh, be on mute if you're not already on mute? We've got a little bit of background noise, that would be helpful, thank you. Uh, so the first contributor, my colleague, Evelyn Hernandez, who is the head of members and affiliates at the COST International Secretariat. Uh, Evelyn will be taking us through uh, the results from the testing of the ITI, provide an overview of those results and explain how they could be used, including, I think, Evelyn, uh, potential uh, international comparisons uh, between different countries. Uh, after that, we're going to move to what we've termed uh, member insights, and then we will have representatives from the five countries, the five cost programs where the ITI has been piloted recently. So we'll go to each of the five representatives and have probably three to five minutes of them sharing some of their uh, key insights. Now, after that, I'm very pleased that we've got a, a discussant, uh, Ian Hawksworth, who is a senior governance specialist in the governance global practice uh, at the World Bank. Now, Ian is not an insider. He hasn't been involved in developing or implementing the ITI, but he's got a wealth of experience around PPPs, investment in infrastructure and infrastructure governance. So his remarks are gonna be primarily based on what he hears today. So it's spontaneous, um, but Ian is very well equipped to do that uh, given the breadth of his knowledge and background. Following uh, Ian's comments, uh, we'll go to Q&A. Uh, and if you can put, as I said, put your questions and comments uh, in the chat, please. And then beyond that, we'll just take a few minutes just for final remarks and a wrap up. Uh, and we will be finished by, uh, I think it's 3.30 uh, UK time. Okay, so that's what we've got planned for you. Uh, at this point, I'm going to invite uh, Evelyn, if you would please, uh, if you, I think Charlotte is going to share her screen. Uh, so we can see the presentation and you'll give us an overview of the ITI results. Thank you, Evelyn. Thanks, Peter. I will wait for Charlotte to uh, share the, the, the presentation. Um, 
and thanks to the programs that uh, the cost program that accepted this challenge of um, uh, testing the ITI manual, the infrastructure transparency index for the first time this year, I am happy and proud to share the initial results and it's a, it's a summary of the results. Um, can you move the slide Charlotte please. The index, the infrastructure transparency index is composed by four dimensions, five variables and 17 sub variables. We have also 93 indicators. The first dimension assesses the national or subnational conditions enabling environment for transparency in the infrastructure sector, considering the regulatory framework, the data standards applied in the country or at subnational level, and the centralized digital tools in place for procuring entities to disclose data. The second dimension is related to capacities and uh, also uh, to capacities and processes of the procuring entities that are under evaluation. The third dimension is um, analyzing or evaluating the citizen participation. It means the opportunity for people to ask questions and to ask for data to the procuring entities and to uh, the capacity of the procuring entities to respond to those questions. Finally, we have a fourth uh, dimension that is related to information disclosure. And basically this is a project level. We selected um, in each procuring entity uh, a sample of projects and we measure the levels of disclosure applying the cost infrastructure data standard or the open contracting data standard. Next slide, please, Charlotte. We apply this um, uh, manual and methodology in five of our programs, and I will start uh, presenting the results from Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, the index was applied at national level and um, we have the, the results here is a summary. We have the national score of 47 points. We have a total of 100 points in general for the index. And we can see that um, the dimension four information disclosure is, uh, has obtained the, the highest score in Costa Rica. Um, basically, uh, if we review all the rest of the dimensions, what we don't have in Costa Rica is the enabling environment to promote uh, transparency and disclosure. Uh, we also have um, low citizen participation and um, some uh, gaps in the capacity and processes of the procuring entities. Next slide, please. Um, here we have the procuring entity ranking in Costa Rica. Uh, basically, for this ranking, we uh, evaluate three dimensions. We separate the first one because it's a national or subnational context. And then uh, in order to, uh, to, to do this ranking, what we apply is the dimension two, um, the dimension three and four. And this is, a, a, this is the results. Uh, we can see that the Ministry of uh, Public Works and, Tram and Transport in Costa Rica obtained the highest score around uh, 77 points. And um, basically uh, it, it's important to highlight that uh, we don't see or assess the individual behavior of uh, public officials. We just see the capacities and processes inside the procuring entity and not um, we don't uh, see or evaluate the um, individual behavior of, um, uh, of the public officials. Next slide, please. 
In contrast, the enterprise for public services of Heredia obtained the lowest score with uh, almost 11 points. There is a huge difference between the uh, highest uh, procuring entity with the highest score, meaning that uh, some of the PEs uh, in Costa Rica, they know a little or nothing about the transparency standards that Costa Rica as a country is committed to implement. Next slide, please. The next uh, um, summary is coming from Honduras, where the IT and the ITI was applied at national level, including uh, 30 procuring entities. Among the four dimensions, enabling environment recorded the highest score of uh, 86 points, uh, whereas the capacities and processes recorded the lowest score of uh, 55 points. We can see here that in Honduras, we have all the um, in legal framework, the standards uh, capacity, and also the, the, the digital tools in place to allow and to promote transparency. Um, but we have the case and the gap in the um, capacities and processes in the procuring entities. Next slide, please. Um, in, in this case, the Ministry of Infrastructure and Public Services obtained the highest score of uh, 99 points. And this is the highest score, not just in Honduras, but also in the five uh, countries that apply this methodology. And this can be explained because of the, this uh, procuring entity has been part of the cost program since uh, the inception of cost in Honduras in 2014, and has been the leading institution managing the system um, to disclose data, and also has been used to work under the cost uh, standards. Next slide, please. Um, as, uh, as you can see, the, 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 the Ministry of Security uh, obtained the lowest score of uh, 25 points. And this is um, the analysis uh, uh, during the interviews and the survey uh, process. We understood from them that um, they are not disclosing data. They are not uh, applying the transparency standards and policies and laws and regulations because of some misunderstanding around the restriction to disclose data um, due to national security reasons, but uh, this uh, does not apply to the infrastructure projects that the, they are managing. Uh, so we have a, now an agenda to discuss around the limitations of using uh, this legal framework for infrastructure projects. Next slide, please. In Ghana, the ITI was applied at some national level, including 15 procuring entities in the Western region of the country. Um, amongst the, the four dimensions, we can see the enabling environment uh, obtained the highest score, whereas uh, information disclosure recorded the lower score uh, with uh, four points. Uh, what, uh, we can understand from this uh, uh, evaluation is that we have in place uh, the legal framework um, the mandates to disclose data, but this is not being the regular practice amongst the procuring entities. Next slide, please. In this case, um, we just uh, evaluated 15 uh, procuring entities and all of them obtained less than 50 points um, indicating low levels of transparency in public infrastructure delivery at the subnational level. Um, you can see that the Ghana Water Company Limited um, score has uh, the highest score uh, followed by the Secondi Takorari Metropolitan Assembly um, which is a member of COST. They are uh, implementing the program and they have uh, 42 points um, according to the ITI uh, methodology. 
We also have uh, some um, uh, municip uh, municipal assembly in the East that is obtaining a very low score of less than one point of the ITI that is uh, indicating the need to promote transparency and accountability in the region and in the country. Next slide, please. In Uganda, um, the, the general score for this year uh, is uh, around 20 points. Uh, we applied the index in 30 uh, entities, procuring entities, and also uh, we selected uh, 60 projects, uh, two from each one of the entities. And a concern around the scores obtained in Uganda is that um, citizens are not involved in the planning and implementation of infrastructure projects. As you can see, the lowest scores are in these uh, citizen participation and capacities and processes of procuring entities. And despite that we have uh, um, a medium um, enabling environment that is uh, allowing mandating disclosure of data, uh, we can see that the practice is not uh, to implement this legal mandate to disclose data. Next slide, please. The three entities that emerge with the best performing um, um, scores um, around the different sectors is the Kampala Capital City Authority, uh, followed by the Uganda National Roads Authority, and uh, thirdly, the Office of the Prime Minister. This entity has been working with the cost program, applying the cost features of uh, multi-stakeholder working disclosure, and also uh, uh, assurance and social accountability. We can see also in, in the next slide, please, that we have a, um, a gap, a, a, a need there to promote the use of uh, um, standards to disclose data and to gather data uh, and to, to, to promote the cost approach in different procuring entities that are still um, uh, having a very low score of less than one point. This is the case of the Burkedea district. Uh, it's a local government in Uganda. Uh, sorry, Evelyn, to interject. I'm not sure we're seeing the correct slide. We're still on Uganda procuring entity. I think it needs to be advanced. Um, yes, I'm sorry, Charlotte. I maybe I, I didn't ask you to. No, that's okay, Evelyn. Can you see it now? Yes, Ian, yes, and please, uh, the next slide is Ukraine. Um, in Ukraine, as well in Honduras, Uganda, and Ghana, the enabling environment obtained the highest score with around 70 points. For the COS Ukraine team, the benefit of applying this um, methodology was uh, to increase the awareness of the openness and transparency of data in the different procuring entities and also the need to involve and inform citizens. The exercise also provide um, a lot of uh, interactions between the, the cost program and the evaluation team. And uh, for them, this was a very uh, good exercise to have the feedback from the procuring entities expressing that they would like to comply with the cost standard, but they need to develop more uh, capacities inside the procuring entities, understanding the uh, open data uh, standards in, that are in place in Ukraine. Next slide, please. And in this case, uh, in Ukraine, the road service in different regions that have been working with the cost approach, they obtain uh, good scores around above um, 70 points in uh, at least the 10, the yes, 11 um, uh, procuring entities that, that are in the uh, top uh, of this ranking in Ukraine. And finally, um, the next slide, please. Um, after the results were, presenting, were presented in Ukraine, um, the team identified the need 
for a post communication with the procuring entities and also um, a request to support the implementation of uh, the general recommendations that are provided for each one of them and in general for all procuring entities participating in this exercise. Um, I can conclude saying that uh, despite the, we have um, uh, five uh, different uh, programs applying the, the, the index, we can compare at some point at least the global scores, you can see there is a, a, a big difference between the global uh, scores. And uh, you can see that uh, the legal frameworks, the, the, the conditions to promote transparency are in place, but um, the practices are completely uh, different amongst the, the, the members. And it depends on, on also the procuring entities implementing or not the cost approach. I will stop here and thanks. I will respond to, to your questions when we have the time for it. Evelyn, thank you for that presentation. Uh, we've got a question now, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll take it immediately if we can uh, from Ian Hawksworth. And he's just asking if you can say a, a few words on the process of scoring. So you're presenting us with the summary of results, uh, but what, how, how does it actually occur? Uh, who, 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 who does the scoring? Is it a purely objective process? Is the subjective element to it? Just tell us a little bit about that process, please. Yes, um, we have uh, the cost members, um, they have a team, uh, evaluation team, they appoint according to a profile that we recommend. Um, this, uh, these are uh, um, professionals that are um, familiar with our methodology, we have a training for them, and then we provide all the tools to collect data and to analyze data. Uh, basically, we are talking about a desk review uh, from the team. We are using uh, official data to evaluate the procuring entities. And um, we also um, have a survey that can be done in two different ways. One is a self-assessment and the second one is an interview. So we apply the different, the two approaches uh, for, for, for this survey. We count and we ask for evidence to the procuring entities responding to this survey. And finally, um, we conclude this uh, evaluation processes um, uh, using, uh, again, uh, the websites, the official websites to corroborate the data that we gather initially um, when we start uh, the evaluation process. Thank you very much, Evelyn. I'm, I'm not sure if Ian will be satisfied with the answer, but we'll find out when it comes to, to his comments. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks very much, Evelyn. Uh, please do continue to put your questions in the, uh, the Q&A. We're going to move on to the next section. <coughs> excuse me, uh, which is member insights. And we have representatives from each of the five countries who were involved in the piloting of the ITI. And we've asked them two things, to think about or to share with us what were the, the most predictable and the most surprising things about the results. And then the second question in two parts, uh, how do you intend to use the results? Uh, A, to improve your national score, and incentivize better performance amongst procuring entities, or alternatively, how you anticipate the results will influence procuring entities and the enabling environment for transparency. Uh, so we've asked each of the presenters to spend between three and five minutes. And I'm very pleased to say that our first contributor is from Cost Honduras. And Honduras in many ways has been a bit of a, a trailblazer actually in, uh, in terms of cost programs. Uh, very much breaking new ground and uh, a high performing country. And I'm very pleased that Cost Honduras is represented today by Maria Andrea Matamoros, who's the Minister of Transparency uh, in Honduras. I think the fact that Honduras has a Minister of Transparency uh, says something quite important. And I'm also conscious, Minister, that you have uh, elections going on or just concluding in your country. So I'm very pleased that you have found time uh, to join us today. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Evelyn, Ian, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And 
um, special greetings to uh, the multisectoral group from Honduras as well. We just had elections this past Sunday, uh, probably uh, one of the most voted elections in our country's history. So it's a triumph for democracy and uh, we're hoping that the new government uh, will work closely with COST International and with um, the country uh, office as well, as closely as we have in the last years. Um, my speech was done in Spanish, so I'll proceed to, to speak in Spanish and, and I'm hoping that um, everyone can, can use the translation if it's needed. Um, so uh, first I'd just like to uh, thank the opportunity uh, that you give Honduras to to explain what is it that we've done in the last months and all the, the lessons uh, that we've learned from the implementation of the Index uh, for Transparency. Para Honduras, eh, es un orgullo eh, que hemos implementado el ITI por tercera vez en nuestro país. En 2017, evaluamos 56 proyectos de cinco entidades y unidades ejecutoras. En el 2019, Honduras junto con Guatemala Fuimos países pilotos de su implementación, una experiencia que permitió a costo internacional la elaboración del manual ITI y que durante el 2021 tuvimos la oportunidad de implementar su nueva metodología. Uno de los valores agregados de esta nueva aplicación del ITI en Honduras es la incorporación de más entidades, incluyendo las alcaldías. Esto resulta eh, extremadamente relevante en momentos como los que vivimos hoy en día con la pandemia por la COVID-19 Eh, donde eh, es necesario la descentralización de recursos eh, para la atención de emergencias eh, por parte de las municipalidades. Asimismo, se elevan los estándares de evaluación de las instituciones, ya que se valoraron los cumplimientos de normativas y las buenas prácticas internacionales, como los datos y las contrataciones abiertas. De las cuatro áreas y dimensiones analizadas, el ambiente facilitador es el que obtuvo el porcentaje más alto con 86.3 puntos, que ya lo explicó Evelyn en detalle. Esta dimensión evaluó las condiciones nacionales que permiten la transparencia para el sector de la infraestructura, teniendo en cuenta el marco jurídico y reglamentario y las herramientas de información digital centralizadas. En ese sentido, nos hemos destacado por tener un marco normativo robusto que exige la publicación de información sobre este tipo de proyectos, como lo es la Ley de Transparencia y Acceso a la Información Pública, la Ley de Contratación del Estado, la Ley de Compras, las Disposiciones Generales del Presupuesto y de la mano las distintas herramientas tecnológicas como ser CISOC, Compras, el Portal de Contrataciones Abiertas, el Portal Único de Transparencia, el Portal de Datos Abiertos de la Secretaría de Finanzas y recientemente creado el Infras. El reto que tenemos es garantizar la socialización y la la aplicación de la normativa y las plataformas disponibles cada vez más y con ello promover eh, una mayor participación ciudadana. La divulgación de la información obtuvo un 59.7% y se basó en medir la cantidad de datos e información divulgada por las entidades de adquisición en proyectos de infraestructura según el estándar de cost eh, Honduras y el estándar de datos de contratación abierta sobre infraestructura. Esto se debe a que Honduras como país miembro de la iniciativa COST implementa el estándar de datos de infraestructura debidamente reconocido mediante un decreto ejecutivo y lineamientos para la verificación de los portales de transparencia. Lo anterior ha permitido la divulgación proactiva de la información esencial del ciclo de proyectos de infraestructura. Sin embargo, uno de los desafíos que tenemos es que la información acerca de los proyectos de información pública se encuentra divulgada de manera divulgada de manera desagregada en al menos cinco plataformas web oficiales. Esto hace difícil la recopilación y el análisis de la información y debemos de trabajar fuertemente para tener un solo portal. La participación ciudadana obtuvo un 55.9 de porcentaje y midió las oportunidades que brindan las entidades contratantes para la participación de los hondureños y cómo los ciudadanos utilizan la información pública divulgada. Dentro de los aspectos positivos a destacar, Encontramos que la mayoría de las instituciones cuenta con espacios de participación que son permanentes y están disponibles por medio de diferentes canales inclusivos de participación. La dimensión de procesos y capacidades sumó 55.6 puntos. Esta área evaluó la solidez de los procedimientos y capacidades de las entidades de contratación para divulgar datos e información y donde se evidenció que la mayoría de las entidades de adquisición conocen sobre la Ley de Transparencia y Acceso a la Información Pública cuentan con capacidades institucionales en el uso de tecnologías digitales 
tienen sitios web institucionales y tienen procedimientos internos que permiten la calidad de los procesos relacionados a proyectos de infraestructura. Como secretaria de Transparencia y representante del gobierno en el grupo multisectorial, estos resultados han sido fundamentales para identificar y comprender los puntos fuertes y débiles de la gestión gubernamental en torno a la transparencia, la participación y la rendición de cuentas en el sector de infraestructura. Y por lo tanto, los insumos del ITI son invaluables para el fortalecimiento del aparato estatal. Las instituciones del gobierno se han caracterizado por tener dentro de sus prioridades garantizar la transparencia en su accionar y las instituciones que ejecutan proyectos de infraestructura están comprometidos en transparentar y aperturar los procesos de infraestructura para mayor calidad de los mismos. No fue sorpresa para nosotros entonces la apertura, la anuencia y el compromiso que tuvimos al momento de implementar ITI, ya que logramos que de las 30 entidades de adquisición seleccionadas se brindara información relacionada a la dimensión 2 y 3. Sabemos que la puntuación obtenida nos coloca en una posición relativamente positiva, ya que evidencia la, los grandes avances en promover la transparencia en el sector de infraestructura. No obstante, aún existen oportunidades de mejora en cuanto a las normas de transparencia en el sector de infraestructura y herramientas nacionales de información digital, como los procedimientos y capacidades en las entidades de adquisición para la divulgación de información y datos, la participación ciudadana y lo relacionado al cumplimiento de los estándares de transparencia en infraestructura. En Honduras, los proyectos de infraestructura están a cargo de instituciones especializadas en la materia. No obstante, pudimos mapear un total de 117 instituciones de adquisición entre el Poder Ejecutivo, Judicial, Universidades Públicas y Alcaldías Municipales que ejecutaron más de 2.000 proyectos de infraestructura durante el periodo 2018 y 2020. Esto nos llevó a entender que es importante el involucramiento de estas entidades al mundo de post, a que conozcan e implementen los estándares de transparencia existentes, que se sometan a los procesos de aseguramiento y apoyen a los ciudadanos, medios de comunicación, comisiones ciudadanas de transparencia, a nuestros auditores sociales e infraestructura, a que puedan realizar procesos de veduría y auditoría social a estos proyectos para tener una mayor rendición de cuentas y asegurar el uso eficiente de los recursos invertidos. Es por esa razón que conformamos la red de enlaces del CISOC para generar sinergias que permitan mejorar los niveles de transparencia y calidad de los procesos de infraestructura y por otro lado, para el debido acompañamiento a los procesos de costo Honduras. Y es gracias a ITI que pudimos identificar en dónde existen deficiencias respecto a la divulgación de información. Es por ello que ahora nos, que nos encontramos creando el CISOX versión 3.0. Podremos con ello incorporar a más instituciones que ejecutan proyectos de infraestructura a que puedan divulgar información sobre sus proyectos en atención al estándar de contrataciones abiertas para datos de infraestructura. Debido a lo anterior, 20 entidades de adquisición tuvieron una calificación por encima del 50% porque atienden las disposiciones de la ley y los lineamientos que ha establecido el Instituto de Acceso a la Información Pública para promover la divulgación de información de este tipo de proyectos. Por parte de COS, ya hemos puesto en acción nuestras recomendaciones al iniciar jornadas de capacitación y formación de capacidades especializadas dirigidas al sector público. Hasta la fecha, hemos capacitado más de 200 funcionarios públicos e hemos implementado cuatro diplomados de transparencia en el sector de construcción e infraestructura sostenible, estos también dirigidos a funcionarios públicos. Cabe mencionar que actualmente estamos llevando a cabo una nueva evaluación de ITI respecto a los proyectos de infraestructura que fueron ejecutados para atender las emergencias de las tormentas tropicales ETA y OTA que azotaron nuestro país en noviembre del año pasado. Esto ha sido un insumo sumamente importante para la implementación de estándares de transparencia en procesos de emergencia, considerando que Honduras es uno de los países más vulnerables al cambio climático. Aunque el camino recorrido ha sido largo y los avances sustanciales aún queda muchísimo por hacer y mantenemos el compromiso de seguir mejorando. En ese sentido, permítanme brevemente darles eh, algunos insumos de hacia dónde vamos a raíz de la implementación de la nueva metodología de ITI. Esperamos la implementación del estándar de contrataciones abiertas para datos de infraestructura en formato de datos abiertos, haciendo su implementación obligatoria a todas las entidades que manejan o ejecutan proyectos de infraestructura pública por medio de la nueva versión del CISOX 3.0. De manera inicial, además, esperamos incorporar al CISOC a todos los miembros de nuestra red de enlaces del CISOC. Son 17 instituciones en total. Y de manera gradual, incorporar la totalidad 
de entidades de adquisición que manejan o ejecutan proyectos de infraestructura pública para una verdadera divulgación proactiva y eficiente, basados en el estándar de contrataciones abiertas para datos de infraestructura al CISOX. Hemos definido una matriz de seguimiento a ser aplicado para atender las, mejor, las mejoras en las deficiencias identificadas con una periodicidad de un año que permita medir las mejoras por medio de la aplicación del ITI, para lo cual COS Honduras establecerá un acompañamiento. Asimismo, buscamos implementar el ITI de manera anual a fin de monitorear las acciones que se generan para mejorar los niveles de transparencia y calidad en los procesos de infraestructura. Para el primer trimestre del año 2021, con el cambio de autoridades, eh, ya que tuvimos el, el reciente proceso electoral, procedemos, procederemos a hacer un proceso de socia, socialización para poder definir acciones de mejora e incrementar los niveles de transparencia en el sector de infraestructura. Eh, así que el camino que queda por delante es un camino ambicioso, pero desde el Gobierno de la República tenemos todo el compromiso y desde el grupo multisectorial de que ahora que estamos en los últimos dos meses de gobierno podamos realizar este proceso de, de socialización confiando en que las nuevas autoridades del país estarán trabajando de la mano con COS de la misma manera que lo hemos hecho en estos últimos años. Les agradezco nuevamente el espacio como miembro del grupo multisectorial de COS y como representante del gobierno reiteramos nuestro compromiso para mejorar el valor del dinero que se invierte en el sector de infraestructura en Honduras. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Minister, for sharing the details of your uh, very successful program. And I do encourage our participants to go to the Cost Honduras website, which can, can be reached through the International uh, Cost website, to learn more about some of the background that you have provided, including the CSOX platform. Um, I'll just mention for our participants who may not be familiar with cost terminology, uh, a multi-stakeholder group is present in each of the cost countries and it brings together uh, the government, private sector and civil society to provide oversight to the program and to bring legitimacy to the program. It has strategic oversight, doesn't run the program on a day-to-day -day basis, but brings the strategic oversight uh, and monitors progress of the program. Thank you very much again, Minister. Uh, I'd like to move on to our second contributor, actually from another high-performing program, uh, Cost Uganda, uh, and I'm delighted that Mr. Bagaya Waiswa, who's the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Works, has found time in his busy schedule uh, to join us today. So, uh, permanent secretary, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, hello, are you, uh, are you getting me? Am I? Yes, I hear you. Yes, I'm not the permanent. I'm not the permanent secretary. Hello, are you Hello? getting me? I am getting you, yes. Yeah, yes, I'm not the permanent secretary. My name is uh, Michael Odongo. Uh, I'm representing the permanent secretary and uh, he asked me to kindly deliver his message to you on this uh, very, very important uh, uh, webinar. And uh, yeah, of course, we have seen the results from uh, the exercise done in Uganda. And uh, the permanent secretary wishes me to say the following. Uh, he says, it is a great honor and pleasure to be part of the global event, uh, the webinar where lessons will be shared from, the implement, from, from implementing the Infrastructure Transparency Index. This webinar will go a long way in showcasing and revealing insights from the Infrastructure Transparency Index, given each participating country's context and results can be used to improve transparency in infrastructure projects. I congratulate all stakeholders and Coast Uganda that participated in the infrastructure transparency process for having achieved this milestone amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. As you're already aware, infrastructure projects are a critical to national development. And this explains why a significant proportion of government expenditure is committed to key projects such as roads, bridges, hospitals, schools, etc. In fact, infrastructure development in Uganda gets a lion's share of the national budget with more than 30% of the national budget. It is therefore important that with the level of public investment, high quality infrastructure is developed to ensure that citizens get value for money. 
course, Uganda is contributing to the realization of good value of transparency and compliance with existing legal frameworks, such as the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Assets Act of 2003. The work of cost, especially the Infrastructure Transparency Index, are informing the efforts of the procurement entities to improve disclosure levels, monitor performance, enhance quality assurance and, and controls, among others. Our minister, who is also the champion of cost in Uganda, launched the Infrastructure Transparency Index on 10th February 2021 during the dissemination of the fourth assurance report in Uganda. Coast Uganda has successfully completed the first index in Uganda and this involved 30 procuring and disclosing entities covering up to 60 infrastructure projects. Of course, the results from the first index in Uganda are not all that impressive, but still this gives us an opportunity for improvement. For example, despite, despite the end, Despite the enabling environment government has put in place to facilitate citizen engagement, we are concerned that in practice, citizens are not effectively and efficiently engaged. The low, the low score of 13.7% has opened our eyes. We are also concerned that access to information is still low at 18.4%, despite the fact that Uganda has an access to information law with its regulations and as an established institutional framework for disclosure. The results have helped us identify discrepancies on the level of performance of entities in implementing infrastructure projects. We learned, we learned that entities have a culture of strengthening one aspect of projects delivery while rendering less focus on other equally important aspects. We will streamline this. The index has helped us learn that putting in place a strong legal and policy framework without deliberately enforcing institutionalization and implementation does not yield results. We need to up our efforts in policy implementation. The government of Uganda will use the results to enhance performance through the following. A stronger political commitment to enhance transparency, re revealing itself in bold actions and implementing sanctions for non-compliance with the legal and policy framework. Secondly, the government of Uganda also, has also adopted the open contracting for infrastructure data standards and the infrastructure data standards, which will strengthen public officials' capacities to use these standards to strengthen disclosure. Thirdly, implement the citizen engagement approach. Locally, we call them Baraza, across all infrastructure projects as a mandatory requirement. Fourth, strengthen our oversight role as the lead sector entity in monitoring performance of infrastructure projects. And lastly, support Coast Uganda to, under to undertake an annual index and position it as a national performance indicator in the sector. This experience has been an eye opener that in areas where we felt we had made strides as a country, we are still performing low. I'm glad that this index provides a framework for improvement. I congratulate Coast International for designing this vital tool and for inviting Uganda to be amongst the first pilot countries. At the Ministry of Works and Transport, we continue to commit our support to Coast Uganda to deliver more infrastructure projects, to deliver more infrastructure transparency index. Through this, we are also able to weigh in on how the infrastructure sector is performing. For God and my country, I end the statement. Thank you very much, Dr. Odongo, and I owe you an apology for not introducing you correctly. In fact, my colleagues did pass me a note, but I didn't read it in time. They informed me the permanent secretary was not available. So thank you for being willing to stand in at very short notice. And I'll just make one observation, if I can, before we move on to the next contributor. You said that Uganda's results were not very impressive. I, I think it's very important to recognize that it does take a degree of political courage to cast a light on these results, even when they may not be as good as, 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 as politicians and, and in fact the people would like them to be. But it does indicate that there's a determination to be very frank about the scale of the challenge that's faced and to start tackling that challenge. 
So I think Cost Uganda, the Ministry of, of Public Works, needs to be congratulated for taking this important step. And uh, all eyes will be on future uh, runs of the index to see uh, how the improvements that you described uh, uh, are being made. So thank you very much for your contribution today. We appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to move on to our third contributor. We are running slightly over time, so I would encourage our, uh, our, our next three contributors to keep the time, if you can, please, up to five minutes. I'm very pleased that we're now going to uh, Sekondi Takaradi, which is a sub-national program. COST has both national programs where the national government takes responsibility, but we do also have sub-national partners, and Sekondi Takaradi in Ghana is a very good example of that. I'm very pleased that uh, COST is represented by Dr. Matthew Kwasamaya, who's, uh, private, who's, who's active in the private sector, but also a lecturer at Takaradi Technical University and a member of the multi-stakeholder group. So please, uh, Dr. I hand over to you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so I will proceed to share some of the outcome emanating from our ITI survey in the subnational. In order, we have 15 entities participating in the survey. And when you look at the sub-national ITI score, as Elia presented, it wasn't very impressive. Uh, recording twin 1.60 wasn't very impressive at all. But regardless of that performance, you realize that when you look, take a keen look at our data for dimension one, we did very well, um, or quite well, recording 60.90. And I think from the presentation by Evelyn, it runs through um, suggesting that in Sekenita Kravitu, we have the laws. The implication that we have the laws, we sit on laws, but there's a strong disconnection between the enabling environment score and the other dimensional scores, meaning that the missing link is implementation, implementation. So we realize that though there are laws, but implementing them, applying them to get us the necessary result was very challenging. Thus, dimension two recording 16.7%, citizen participation recording 20.4%, and then information disclosure recording 3.69%. Um, surprisingly, though dimension three recorded 20.40%, um, within dimension three, we realize that the entities attempt or doing their best to disclose. But even with the little disclosure done, citizens are not utilizing the information. So we have very low score of citizens using the information disclosed. This possibly could be attributed to the system of governance largely um, 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 being implemented in Ghana. You realize that most of our projects are initiated at the top. It's the implementation that is done at the local level. So once it is top down approach, the citizens are not well engaged in the project conceptualization and even um, implementation. This also suggests the, that there's a higher probability, though the cost did not seek to measure, that there is a higher probability that the needs of the citizens were not incorporated in the infrastructure delivery. As earlier highlighted, not in this ITI survey, but in our previous assurance survey. So you could see the link between the previous assurance studies that we have done and this ITI survey, though they are two different instruments measuring two different things. But regarding citizens' participation, you realize that there is that disconnection. Also, you, you, can, you can see that aside this 
um, there is low level of disclosure, low level of information disclosure. This is because though we have the laws promoting disclosure, there is no comprehensive data point that guides disclosure. So all the PEs are doing their best to dis disclose element of um, some data point for the public consumption. And generally, this is what transpired in the Ghana survey. And our great challenge was that though there are laws promoting disclosure, but there's that uh, subconsciousness fear that the information being disclosed may be used um, to the advantage of one political party or the other. We therefore recommend that MSG um, should engage, continue to engage um, stakeholders, specifically the PEs that took part in the survey to facilitate their capacity building so that they would be up to speed and then discharge their duties to meet what is required of them. Also, um, MSG, should, in collaboration with PPA, could align or adopt cost ideas to strengthen um, disclosure in the sub-national. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kwa Samaya. Uh, you've given us a great insight in a, in a very brief time into some of the challenges you face in Sekondi Takaradi. Uh, importantly, you remind us of the potential politicization of the results of the ITI as well. I think there are a lot of interesting dimensions there. And if we have time, we might return to some of those in the, in the Q&A. But thank you very much uh, for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts. Uh, we have two more brief presentations. Uh, the next one is from our colleagues, uh, Cost Ukraine, uh, represented today by the ITI survey expert, Mrs. Nadia babinska Werner. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Cost Ukraine evaluated 30 procuring entities. Five of them, uh, they didn't want to cooperate with us. And we also evaluated 16 infrastructure projects in order to determine Ukraine's ITI scores. Uh, so the general ITI score is 62 and the best scores are for uh, national legislative um, level, level of uh, legislative environment. Because we have really good uh, access to public sector information law with proactive disclosure requirements. We have also adopted open data a decree that requires publishing public sector information uh, in open data format and we have specific uh, laws regarding mm. open data in procurement budget spending it's something that was uh, that emerged after revolution of dignity in ukraine in 2014 and these laws are um, uh, enacted and they are working and all procuring entities should publish their data about procurement on the uh, one of the best e-procurement system in the world Prozora, and also all the uh, budget spending data are also available online um, and uh, everybody can access it. Uh, they also, uh, in Ukraine, we have also um, cost portal for publishing data about uh, infrastructure projects. And also in 2020, e-construction system was established where, where data about infrastructure projects uh, uh, also published. It's more about constructions uh, and reconstruction, but it's also a very good source of information and uh, data uh, and, plan, and it is planned that data will be available to this system via API uh, for all users and data will be published. And also in our regulations, there are some kind of requirements to publish data in infrastructure data standards or open contracting for infrastructure data uh, project standards. 
Uh, we also evaluated uh, the capacity for publishing and providing information, and we can say that some entities, they uh, proactively uh, do something to publish and make, uh, and make uh, data about the project available because they see that it attracts funding because of the structure of the uh, funds of these procuring entities, especially if you're talking about local procuring entities, and they, they see that the more they are open the more the more they communicate the infrastructure project the, the more uh, funds they attract from for example uh, from local communities uh, that delegates them uh, these uh, infrastructure projects to be implemented and it's also increased level of trust to the activities and for example some uh, procuring entities it was a surprise for, for for us for example some procuring entities they promote their work, they promote uh, their resources where people can find information. They have their Facebook, Instagram accounts, they have YouTube channels, they, they procure drones to provide, you know, this whole holistic information about the uh, infrastructure project um, implementation. And also all data, as I told you, are published about procurement on Prozora and on spending uh, uh, open uh, budget uh, portal. Uh, of course, there is a problem with uh, the understanding why they have to publish data especially if we're talking about the process of initiating uh, 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 infrastructure projects. And this is the problem of the whole structure of uh, uh, how infrastructure projects are implemented in Ukraine, because one entity is they, they initiate uh, infrastructure projects, and it can be that other entities procuring entities, they implement it. And it means that we don't have this, you know, this legacy between these two um, procuring entities, or there can be also three procuring entities because another procuring entity can also be responsible for other part of the infrastructure project implementation. And it makes our, uh, for us very difficult also to track and to understand whether we have transparency in this infrastructure project implementation, because it's hard to, uh, you know, to search each uh, part of infrastructure project um, uh, in different resources. The lowest, the lowest and the weakest part of the infrastructure, pro inf infrastructure uh, in Ukraine is citizen involvement. Uh, we have the lowest rates uh, because as I told you, procuring entity not always responsible for the initiation of these uh, uh, projects and they don't understand why should they communicate something if they are just implementers yeah they are just project executors as opposed to initiators and it means that um they don't need, according to the law, to engage with citizens. It is it's part of project management. And another issue here is related that uh, infrastructure project information uh, is uh, available mostly on the level and the best data on the procurement stage, as opposed to planning and technical supervision stages. It means that it's easy to find, uh, it's more or less easy to find data about procurement, but how this procurement was planned and how the infrastructure project was implemented, I mean, supervision stage, it's really hard to find this data. And another conclusion what we have is that now the most open uh, procuring entities, uh, as Evelyn also mentioned, it is some it, it is those procurement entities with which cost was working during its project uh, activities, and when uh, there are um, very good uh, practice of openness. For example, in Lviv region, yes, we have one of uh, uh, best uh, one of the best ITI scores uh, in the west of Ukraine, where the uh, there, where the practice, the culture of openness is a little bit higher than in other regions. So there are a lot of things should be done. And uh, if it is possible, I can also uh, show you how our ranking system looks like for people who were asking uh, about how, how scoring system looks like and uh, talking about uh, how um, all scores were evaluated and over, uh, overseen. We have, uh, so for example, I was involved in the evaluation uh, and scored uh, PEs, then another expert scored also PEs.
experts uh, have uh, differences. The third uh, regional coordinator uh, had to review all scores and review all answers. And uh, this final decision was uh, put into the final scores. And also the regional coordinator from COST International also revised all scores. So we can be sure that these uh, the scores are impartial and without any political or other uh, intrudence into our scoring system or into our evaluation. Thank you very much, Nadia. It's fascinating some of the uh, uh, the developments in Ukraine, and you remind me that it's very much a country of contrasts. On the one hand, absolutely an international leader in terms of the open government reforms that have undertaken, award-winning in many cases, but also a country where there are parts of government. How shall I describe it? Still extremely stubborn and unwilling to disclose information or to get involved in these kind of reforms that you're, uh, that you're talking about. So a challenging environment, but uh, one where fantastic progress is being uh, made. So very pleased that you would share some of your experience with us today. Thank you for that. I want to move on uh, now, if we can, to our final contributor in this section uh, from our friends at Cost in Costa Rica. Uh, and they are represented today by engineer Oscar Arce Villalobos on behalf of the private sector, Chamber of Architecture and Engineering Consultants. Uh, Oscar, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, from the test results that uh, Evelyn shared, uh, we can conclude uh, a number of things. Um, the most important of all, we believe, is that uh, not surprisingly, our institutions, uh, especially those uh, related to uh, infrastructure uh, development, they are very consistently back a system to manage uh, uh, projects that is robust and uh, creates and facilitates um, the access of uh, public to uh, the information. Even when some might have an infant version of such a system, there is no consistency among efforts by different institutions. And of course, this in itself creates a barrier for citizens to be able to follow and understand how projects develop. Very significantly, it is not possible for citizens to be aware of contracting process design, um, meaning the very beginning of the process where the condition for participants are uh, defined and created. Um, either they're able to follow budget changes along the way. Not surprising, citizen participation rating uh, currently is as a low uh, grade of 37.4. Our team, um, as any other interested party, uh, of course, uh, all citizens need to chase information through a very cumbersome process of talks and negotiation with officers in charge. You might be able to get it, but you have to go through a very cumbersome process to get this information. And very frequently, this information is inexistent at all. Knowledge regarding cost or open contracting guidelines is not common among our public servants uh, across all institutions. The opportunity is that normalization of project procurement information transparency standards might bring about are not institutionally valued, not recognized. Our conclusion is that we need to support top leadership in better understanding how cost can help uh, cost, uh, uh, can help uh, to uh, fully integrate the benefits of cost and open standards initiatives in their day-to-day -day, uh, work. Um, authorities do recognize the importance of transparency in the fight of corruption. You see that in uh, their speeches and, and participations and the, when, you know, at times when they're questioned about that. Uh, but they play a very low profile regarding proactiveness, guidance and leadership for the purpose of creating a culture of transparency in all the uh, institutions. Authorities um, 
should act and actively support the adoption of common standards and best practices. A key element is the support of systematization to enable consistency and facilitate access to relevant information by all stakeholders. It needs uh, decisions at the very high level. Um, and of course, the support uh, through uh, the right uh, budgeting for uh, the adoption of these uh, systems. Moving forward, we see a big opportunity in the near future. Uh, Costa Rica uh, is going through general elections in February, and this is a big chance for us to influence decision making from the very beginning of a new uh, government. Our intent thus is to focus on sharing the results of this assessment with uh, future government officials uh, to help them uh, uh, through this fresh start, understand and work on uh, institutionalization of uh, open contracting standards. Even when Costa Rica has committed to OECD standards of practice, uh, we need to help these new authorities understand how to operationalize cost as a transparency tool. Mm -hmm. Because we believe that's where the major issue is. Uh, they may be informed, they may know uh, how this tool may help and, and work, but the key, uh, the key most in, uh, important issue for authorities we notice is understanding how to operationalize on this. We intend to contribute a gap analysis of currently spread legislation and normative that do exist relative to the conditions that institutions might require to adopt and efficiently manage their standard. This gap analysis, uh, we believe, um, should save, save uh, uh, sorry, should save implementation time and efforts by the new government. Even when uh, some gaps have been identified that might require new legislation, we believe there can be much short-term opportunities to promote cultural change operating on the basis of executive orders and decrees to avoid long periods of negotiation at the legislative uh, level. We intend to identify such specifics in the coming months before the new government takes over to help speed up decision-making as early as possible. Uh, we fully believe that uh, getting to this level of appreciation of uh, transparency by the new uh, officials uh, will not be enough, but the role is key to the success of this airport. Sharing the results of the survey with them, uh, but very critically helping them to understand again, the operationalization opera and implementation of best practices can drive tangible, long-lasting change. In summary, even when the assessment showed some advance relative to the existence of key information, the team found evidence of little leadership commitment that reflects in a very slow process of adoption of best practices, including systematization and availability. Getting leadership to a higher level of understanding and support for the process is critical for our success and should be our focus. Current test results provide an objective baseline to start with. We will focus on getting new government commitments for the adoption of open contracting standards across all procurement processes, but very important, a commitment to work on the cultural change that is needed for transparency to become a day-to-day -day way of doing business. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Oscar. Fascinating story to tell in Costa Rica. And I think uh, amongst many reasons why uh, your experience is important. I think an OECD country that's uh, is being willing to expose itself in this way and to uh, publish data in the form of the ITI uh, it, it, it sends a very good message to other OECD countries. Amongst them, sometimes there's a perception 
the OECD countries wouldn't necessarily benefit from these types of reforms. Uh, I think that's a mistake, and I think uh, Costa Rica can begin to show uh, some of the benefits of the ITI and the other aspects of the cost reform process. So thank you very much for sharing your experience. Uh, that brings us to the end of that section, but really uh, the main section of today's event. Um, and I would now like to turn to Ian Hawksworth uh, from the World Bank. Um, and Ian, we, we're very keen uh, to hear your reflections on, on anything that you've heard. So I invite you to share your thoughts with us, please. Um, th thanks very much, uh, Peter, and, and indeed, thank you very much to to these uh, to the speakers. Uh, it's a uh, uh, no five minute uh, discussion will do justice to the granularity and and the insights that that we just heard, and indeed, the impressive amount of work that's gone into this. Um, uh, that that you've the journey you've gone through and the and the work that you've undertaken. Let me let me. I'll be speaking from sort of a World Bank operational perspective, um, but also uh, I'd like to to tell you a little story where I, I used to be. I used to work at the OECD where I was head of the PPP and Capital Budgeting Unit in the Governance Department. And one of the things we did was we did a survey of budgeting practices and procedures, and we got all the data from our countries. This was a, a self-assessment in the sense that we had a questionnaire, the countries filled it out, and, and we then had the data in a, in a, in a uh, website. And we, we developed various indices, some of which were published, medium-term expenditure frameworks and use of performance budgeting and various things. And we also developed a budget transparency index, but we didn't publish it um, because it was pretty, it, was, it, it, it showed a particular group uh, of countries that were lagging dramatically and uh, I, I, and then the, the the global financial crisis hit, and three of the five countries that were lagging all were effectively bankrupt. So no, so Greece, Portugal was obviously two of them, and then there was a third. And my point with this is that the countries, this was transparency. So transparency for me is is a is a canary in a coal mine. If you're serious about working on your transparency, you're, you're probably going to be serious about a lot of things as a country and as a political uh, uh, decision-making process. And, and, and then again, there was another nugget of information, which we all know, you probably all know this, but the main conduit, the main avenue for corruption is through the investment budget, is through capital investment. So again, on, on, on that, and, um, and uh, for the famous, there are a number of examples how if you get this, if you get this wrong, there is an infusion of corruption into the political society, and of course, the French system and 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 having a former president go to go to jail or at least be convicted of of, of fraud uh, is is an indicator of that. So um, it's important stuff, and and I must congratulate Cost and and you and 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 you that have undertaken this journey on on, on grappling or taking the bull by the horns. Um, so I was reflecting on some of the key questions around this index, right? So clearly it is needed, partly for this country journeys and partly for those of us who work to support countries on these reform journeys um, as indicators of concern and then of indicators of progress. This is the type of, of work that we need in order to support the countries in the, in the best way. My second point on whether it's needed is that that this is so, this is topical, and it's 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 uh, it's a red hot topic, if you will, right? If you look at discussions at the at the G20, the the QII Osaka principles. If you look at issues around the belt, the Chinese belt and and road initiative, um, the EU just came out yesterday with a new initiative for for three hundred billions of, of of investment in the near in in the in their surrounding areas. And so on, so forth. And infrastructure governance and transparency is a key dimension to this. Um, we've talked about how you do it. Um, I, I, I was thinking that the um, one of the reasons why the progress on some of these countries this is so impressive is because what what I heard from all of them was you don't get to undertake an. A, 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 work like this without some commitment, right? It, 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 
you have to engage with the countries, you have to engage with the, with the, with the um, institutions, um, which in itself reflects in sort of engagement, ownership, political commitment, and, and therefore momentum. I mean, to varying extents. And of course, we all know that, that sometimes a government is very interested and then it may be less so. I mean, the, the, the Honduras example, of course, is very impressive and, and the Ukrainian post-revolution also. But I think some of the other issues that were raised by, by you in, regarding Uganda, uh, Costa Rica and Ghana also point to a, a, a high degree of seriousness with which the government and the units have, have, are tackling these issues. So uh, engagement and commitment uh, is impressive here, but it also reflects the requirement for undertaking this work is, is high and heavy, right? Compared to something else like the OBI, the Open Budget Index or things like that. Um, I was surprised by some of the variations in score. Um, the, 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 Costa, the Costa Rica, Honduras discrepancy or difference, 47 versus 63, it's, it's, it's very large, I find. Um, so, um, and I'm wondering how, and I think that's something we, we want to discuss, how uh, results are validated and how consistency is, is ensured. But um, I think uh, it was already mentioned um, in one of, by one of the speakers that the key point is regulation versus implementation. This is a very difficult thing to assess. Um, it's a very heavy process to assess, but that of course is a, is a key issue. The, the citizen engagement dimension, again, I know it's, 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 it's one of the major value adds of cost, and, but I think it's rightly so, and it should be continuously emphasized because I don't think we do that well enough, certainly not at the World Bank, but also a number of other institutions and in another of, uh, in a number of, of um, our, our sister organizations. And a final thing I want to, to uh, that struck me about the presentations is the granularity um, and therefore the, 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 because it's so granular, and detailed and data-driven, it's also very operational. And again, I think this is a great quality that, um, that is not always present that somebody else might not do, right? You could, you'll have the IMF fly in and fly out and, and, and come or other organizations, but this level of granularity, somebody has to do. You can only do it if you build trust with the counterparts and if you have the expertise, which cost has to, to make that available. So let me, let me end my comments with a couple of questions um, to the speakers, um, three questions. I'd, I'd like to hear your ideas of, or comments on how heavy was this process? I mean, and I'm, 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 I'm thinking uh, if, 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 a, if a, a colleague from another country asked you, so how heavy is this process? And then the second, the second question I, I'd like to you to reflect on the enabling environment for undertaking this, right? What, what, um, what enabled, where, where did the courage come from to, to let yourself potentially be exposed like this? Um, what, is the, what is the genesis of this? And then um, finally, again, uh, what, advice would you give to countries thinking about doing this? I think those are my, those are my final remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. I'm trying to scribble your questions down uh, as you're talking. Uh, before you, uh, we let you go, let, we move on Ian. I wanted to put one question to you and it's something that's come up informally be between you and I when we've discussed. Could I invite you just to talk a little bit about the potential advantages and disadvantages of doing international comparisons? We've been looking at the, the national level, perhaps comparing one procuring entity with another procuring entity within one country or an economy. What would be the advantages and disadvantages of comparing countries, of having almost like a league table, you could uh, develop one. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, my, I, I think it is a good idea. 
and and I know there are a lot of methodological problems associated with and anybody who's been following the debate on doing business and how we have discontinued at the bank will will note how it's a difficult thing to do but at the same time I think your cost is uniquely positioned to do this um I think you have the knowledge I think you have the um, the contacts, the expertise, and, and because you work with such granularity, you also have the credibility rather than um, doing it at a very aggregate level. The devil is in the detail, right? So you will have to have another index if you're doing it at national level, because I don't think you can engage, well, you, you, you can't engage with, a, I don't know how many countries, but let's just say 50 countries, 100 countries, with less level of detail. So you would have to think about, okay, how do we do this in a lighter way? How do other countries do it? Well, there are basically two ways of doing it. You either ask the countries to fill out a survey um, or you ask somebody else to, to give an evaluation of the country along a, a survey, right? Or you do both, but you need to choose, I think. And then you need to, to figure out how you make a credible assessment of regulation versus implementation um, at an aggregate level, which is, which is where you will be attacked, right? So if you do this, you need to be ready for it. And how do you respond to that? Well, by being clear on your methodology and transparent and consistent. Um, it's, I mean, that's easy to say, but it's really dif it's difficult to do. But I think there is no it doesn't exist, right? So who would be who would be interested? I think the country would benefit from it. I think the international community is interested in it. Nobody else is doing it. Um, and increasingly, it cannot be done by multilateral development institutions because we are under so much pressure for this. So, so one example would, and we've talked about this, is the Open Budget Index, which is an independent organization and which does this and uh, for, for regards to budgetary transparency. Um, so I, I would strongly urge you to consider doing it. Um, and this does not mean you discontinue this granular work that you're doing here, which is clearly valuable. It means you distill, you engage with the stakeholders here today and you get their input on how do we do this at national level and, uh, and how do we do the first 30 countries. Um, and a final thought is that maybe one thing that you could work on a little more, and I know you're very aware of this and working on it, is, is, the, is the institutional investor and, and the ESG, um, environment, social and governance trend that's sweeping the investment world, right? So the biggest investors in the world, the ones that manage everybody's pension funds, they are increasingly interested in investing in, in these countries, and they're increasingly investing in doing it properly. What are some of the indicators they decide on how to determine risk of going into Honduras? It's to look at transparency of infrastructure. And there you would, you would be able to play a unique role also on that side. So there would be cross pressure from citizens, from governments, and from business. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, very insightful as always. We really appreciate uh, your participation today. Uh, we only have about five minutes left. So uh, th there are some questions that have gone uh, into the Q&A. Uh, Ian also posed some, some very important questions about how heavy the process is, the commitment of time and effort involved, what the necessarily necessary enabling environment is and advice that you would give to other countries who are thinking about entering this process. Um, we, some of the questions that we have in the Q&A, is there a separate review of the evaluation team scores from Mark Pyman, who I know well? Uh, Karina Rebegea, uh, could you give a few more details on the differences between the national and subnational level scores uh, where available? Uh, Barbara Schreiner, I know that another friend I know that there's a question from you um, reflecting our try and paraphrase. You've seen some of the improvements that have flowed uh, from the Prozoro system in Ukraine. That's very well known. Uh, are there, is there similar analysis uh, amongst the countries who have been uh, on the platform today? Uh, the index probably, it's too early for the index to directly influence that level of improvement, but other aspects of the cost program may have. 
Uh, I think I've got most of the questions there. Now, I do regret and I apologize. We're not going to answer all these questions in detail. But what I will commit to do is to write up a short note where we take these questions and we will develop written answers uh, and we will circulate them amongst everyone who registered today. What I might just do in the last few minutes, Evelyn, is just give you uh, an opportunity uh, to come back. You provided the overview. If there are any of these key questions that you would like to pick up and respond to, uh, please take a minute or two uh, to do that now. And then we will follow up with the participants and give written answers to the other questions. So uh, do come in for a couple of final remarks, Evelyn, please. Yes, thanks, Peter. Maybe the ones related to national and subnational um, results and scores. We, as a, you may know, we have um, members at national level. It means the country is joining COST in the case of Honduras and um, Costa Rica, uh, Uganda, and Ukraine. But also, we have subnational members. It's the case of Secondita Corari, a Metropolitan Assembly in Ghana. So what we did uh, in that case, uh, particularly in Ghana, was to do a, a, a subnational um, index. Uh, and we um, selected a region, in this case, the west, uh, of the west part of the country, to participate in this. So there are no, um, at national level, there are no procuring entities participating in this uh, process in Ghana. Um, that's uh, the difference between the two of them. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Uh, as we come to the closing remarks, some more questions coming in. Uh, Mark Pyman is in his stride now and he's inserted two additional questions. I apologize, Mark, but we will get back to you with written answers. Uh, we've also had a request if we could share your presentation, Evelyn, so we can certainly do that. I don't see uh, any reason not to do that. Uh, so everyone who's registered for the session today, uh, you will get a follow up uh, from us where we'll develop some answers to uh, written answers to the questions that we haven't been able to answer. Uh, we will also perhaps provide some key links to some of the other materials that have been referenced uh, today, and we will share the presentation. Uh, that Evelyn gave. Um, just by way of concluding remarks, I, I, I must thank everyone who uh, put the time and effort to join us today, uh, particularly our presenters. You're all extremely busy people involved in uh, very challenging reforms in your respective countries. Uh, so it's, uh, we really have great gratitude for you finding the time uh, to be with us today and to share your results. Uh, all the participants who joined uh, for most of the session, we had uh, well over 40 participants. I know that about 70 uh, actually registered uh, for the event. Uh, so thank you for everyone who's joined us. I think what we've shared today is that uh, the, the initial results are very interesting. They come from very diverse countries. There are some similarities amongst those countries that have, that have ran the index, uh, but there are important differences as, as well context specific differences. There has been an enormous amount of work that's gone into developing the index. And I think it shows in terms of its quality. That doesn't mean that it can't be reproved and refined. Uh, I'm sure that it will, uh, but there's been a huge amount of time and effort and it's really good quality work. So congratulations to Evelyn and David and all the others who have contributed to developing uh, and those at the country level who have helped us on that journey and tested the index. It's extremely relevant. Ian referred to it as uh, tackling a, a red hot topic. It does have enormous potential, I believe. So um, I think we're gonna be hearing a lot more about the index uh, in the future. Uh, so with those words, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to close the proceedings there and you will hear from us in the next week or 10 days with our follow-up. Thank you very much for joining us today. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.